it's not like it used to be when we were kids. The pressures, the expectations, the uncertainty. It seems like being young grows more difficult each year. And being a parent comes with an ever-increasing level of anxiety. God, as a new school year begins, we ask for your hand to rest on the shoulders of our children. May your presence be palpable, your wisdom accessible, and your glory undeniable. We pray you would guard their hearts, guide their steps, and keep them safe. As they walk the halls, may their eyes be fixed on you. When they're overwhelmed, grant them peace. And when they're uncertain, grant them understanding. Thank you for entrusting us with your creation. Now, as they go back to school, we entrust them to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Going back to school, or some are going to a new school, um, we're praying for you and we're asking God to provide for you, to protect you. Um, but most of all, I'm praying that God would come inside of you and grow you from the inside out. This is, in fact, what we've been um, talking about all through this series, One Self, Two Self, Old Self, New Self, is that we need God living inside of us to not only to make us new, but to grow us up, to renew our thinking, renew our minds, renew our, um, our outlook on the world. And that's where we're going to end today. But since it is back to school, and it's a celebration for all the parents, um, and because, as you can see, I am now boot free. But everybody's here for the first time, watching online for the first time. They're like, why did he just put his foot out and everybody applauded? That's weird. Yeah. Yeah, it is weird. Actually, I've been wearing a boot for the last five weeks, and today I am boot free for the first time, and I'm very happy. So we're celebrating several things this morning. But if you want a balloon, if you want to puff up a balloon, I'm going to invite you to come up. And I looked down here like they're going to be the most likely. Teenagers are the least likely to come up. But this guy, anybody else? want to blow up a balloon. Come on, it's, it's balloon time. I got balloons here, and I need my wife to help me out. Here, pink matches. Yeah, all right. Actually, you can pick your own color. You can pick your own color. He's like, I'm going to pick a pink. Uh, come on now. Come on now. Don't be shy. So, thank you, Jeff. Jeff is actually a teenager. He's just gone a little gray prematurely. Uh, yeah, puff it, puff it up. Come on, blow them up. Yep, and uh, Allison's going to tie it off for you. You got to blow it up. Right, and uh, and then she's going to tie it off for you, and uh, yep. Once you got it where you want it, anybody else? Anybody else? Balloons? You don't have to stand up here if you don't want to. But but everybody's looking at me. <laughs> Never in my life, Pastor, has anybody offered me a balloon on a Sunday morning <laughs> in church, and probably never will again. Here you go. Yeah, come on. What color you want? You can take whichever color you want. Blue. Nice. All right, good. All right, so while they're blowing their balloons up, I want to just remind you what we've been doing. We've been talking about how inside a, a believer, inside somebody who's been born again, inside somebody who's uh, confessed their sins, repented of sin, and asked Christ to come in to heal them, uh, to save them, and to give them an et uh, eternal life with God, uh, you have been now filled with God's Spirit. And so Allison's going to come along here and she's going to tie off your balloon. And, and this is you. Remember that commercial? This is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. And it's like a fried egg, right? Well, this is you. This is you filled up. But, but, but here's the thing about these balloons. Where, where, where are they going? I mean, okay, so, so release your balloon and see where it goes. It goes down. It goes down. And uh, yeah, that's about as far as you're going to get when you're huffing and puffing on your own. Uh, don't need the string, do you? Tie that string to your wrist. You don't want to lose that one, Jeff. <laughs> so if you want your balloon to go somewhere, if you want your heart to be more than just like, you know, a flop, 
you're going to need somebody else to fill you up. Now, I'm not going to let go of this one because this green balloon will be up there for the next three years. So tie, tie that one off. Now let's compare the balloons that you inflated. And now while you're all standing behind the table, nobody can see you. Come on over here where they can see you. We're going we're to compare the balloons that you self-inflated uh, to the balloon that Allison is hopefully able to tie off. I'm sorry, my hands are shaking. It's really nerve-wracking to be up here tying a... I know. Yeah, so she... Just pan right, guys. Just pan right. I'll be over here while she's tying balloons. <laughs> okay, no, she got it. Woo! All right, so now that balloon, if she lets it go, it's going up. Your balloon that you inflated on your own with your own breath the stale, hot air that came out of your lungs. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. Now, there may be beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, there's no life. There's no buoyancy. You see now the balloon that she's got over there is full of some nice, good quality balloon time helium. Or, according to the metaphor, it's full of spirit. Thank you, everybody. Let's give them a round of applause. You may be seated. You may keep your balloon. <laughs> yes. I think you might be a Georgia fan. I'm not entirely sure. Yes, and, and you applaud for that. All right, that's fine. Yeah. Here's what I want you to know. This is the lesson, and then maybe that was the children's sermon plus, plus Jeff, uh, is when the Holy Spirit comes into you, your life, your, your nature changes. You become different. You go from being dead to being alive. You weren't sort of dead before. You were spiritually dead in your sins and transgressions, morally incapable of pleasing God. So every time you went, and you let go, you went, and that was about all you were capable of. That's all I was capable of. That's all any of us are capable of. But then once you came to Christ, a person, a divine person comes into you and changes you inside. Paul talks about how outwardly we are wasting away. He's talking about our bodies. So the outer flesh, the outer body is still in a state of decay, right? And you're going to die and you're going to either go in a hole or a pot depending on, you know, what you, how you dispose of your remains. But when Christ comes back, He's going to give you an outer self, an outer you, a new body that will never decay. But here's the point. Inside, you are being renewed daily. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 5. This is the last text in our series on one self, two self, old self, new self. And this is Paul's summary statement regarding who you are now that you are in Christ. Who you are now that the Spirit of God lives within you. So here we go. Uh, Romans 8, chapter, uh, sorry, Romans 8, verse 5, 2 into 1. Here we go. Those, and of course my iPad decides to uh, spaz. My iPad is evidently full of some other spirit. It needs to be exercised. Okay, here. Those who live according to the flesh, this is lumpus, the old nature, have their minds set on, what's the, on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. And we'll, we'll unpack that phrase, realm of the flesh, here in a second. You, however, I'm going to need a new iPad here. You, however, 
are not in the realm of the flesh if God's Spirit is within you. And, verse 9, you, however, are not in the flesh but in the Spirit if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells within you. All right, so here's what I want you to see about that. The translators of the NIV have added a couple of words. They added the words realm of, realm of the flesh, realm of the spirit. The words realm of do not appear in the original Greek text. Why did they add those words? Because they want you to understand that it's not about being in your body or out of your body that makes the difference. It's about what your nature is defined according to. If your nature is defined according to the flesh, which is the world, everything that is fallen and under the curse and under the sin, then you live in a realm that is dictated by, ruled over by flesh, fallenness, sin. However, if you have the Spirit of God living inside your body, then you are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Holy Spirit. This is what it means to be born again born by the Spirit. That's what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 3. It makes sense then to all of us that we should get to know what this spirit life is all about, wouldn't you say? Get to know what this new spirit life is all about. This is why I preach this series, so that you believers would be able to take hold of Paul's teaching on the old self and the new self. You now have been given a new nature, and your nature is no longer defined by who you are in and of yourself. Your nature is defined by who lives within you. You plus the Spirit. You plus Jesus. And so when Paul talks about the flesh nature, I call it Mr. Lumpus. So that you would look over here and go, oh, yeah, we don't like him. We don't want to be like him. And then I say, okay, Mr. Snively over here, this is somebody who's been born according to the Spirit. This is somebody who has a body, just like you. You have a body, but within you is dwelling the Spirit of the living God. Spirit of the living God. And he's he's really in there. He's really actually inside you. And unfortunately, what I have found so often is, at least in my life, is that even though the Spirit of God lives within me, I don't always behave that way. Right? Can anybody testify that even though the Spirit of God, I believe, you, you say, I believe the Spirit of God lives within me, but I don't always behave that way. Yes? Okay, some of you didn't raise your hands, and I'm assuming that means that you're perfect because you didn't raise your hands. So, and in church, we, we, we like to assume we're all perfect. But here's the trick. The Spirit of God is living within me, living within you, and I don't always listen to His voice. I don't always follow His lead. I don't always operate according to the Spirit. I operate according to those old rules. And I I get confused in my, so am I born again? Am I new in Christ? If I've got this same old hang-up, this same old sin stronghold, this same old broken toe that every time I try to walk, it screams at me, and I get mad, or I get sad, or I get discouraged, or depressed, or what have you. And what I want to say to you is the New Testament fundamentally is written to Christians trying to figure out how to be Christians. Because this is the thing. We don't naturally behave like God. Newsflash. We don't naturally operate according to the thoughts and the ways of God. This should not be a newsflash to you because we just read together Isaiah 55 verse 8 where God says, my thoughts are not like your thoughts. My ways are not like your ways. We're different, God says. And to which we should all say amen. I've discovered that in my life. And yeah, time and time and time again, I'm tripping over myself. Because God's ways and my ways naturally go opposite. Paul says, the flesh is hostile to God. 
opposed to God. And this is where you were born. And this is where I was born. And this is where every human being on the planet, save one, ended up. And what, what was the name of the one? Yes, Jesus. And so Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, goes out and does the will of God, and never once does he give in to the voice that says, can you trust God? Maybe you need to do it your way. Maybe if you're really going to get this done right, maybe if you're really going to get marriage done right, parenting done right, your job done right, driving through traffic done right, coaching your kids a uh, little league team or, 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 or building a friendship. You need to do it your way. And the flesh was right there to go, sounds good, let's do it. This is why we need forgiveness. Because you see, not only is the flesh hostile to God, but Paul says God is hostile to the flesh. He is bringing judgment to all who say, I think I'll go my way. I think I'll reject God, reject this spirit person. I don't really care to have uh, any spirits living in me. I'm going to reject that, and I'm going to go my way. And God says, you can go your own way, but guess where you're going to end up? All by yourself in pain and suffering. To operate according to the flesh leads to death. God says, if you want life and you want peace, you can only have it in the author of life, in the giver of peace. Try to find it your own way, and you're going to end up with none of it. So you can fight that all day long. It's kind of like if I go to the doctor and the doctor says, okay, um, uh, you got cancer, and you're going to need treatment. Otherwise, the cancer is going to kill you. And I go, you know what? I think I'll go my own way. I think I'll try it my way. And in six months, I'm dead. Well, the doctor warned me. The doctor told me. Or, or, or uh, I go to the mechanic, and the mechanic says to me, hey, you need a new transmission. And I say, I, you know, I think I'm going to try it my way. And I get in my car, and I go to put my car in gear, and all I hear are gears grinding. And I go, I can drive this car just fine. Well, there's nothing wrong with it. And I try to drive my car down the road, and the engine falls out. The mechanic warned me it's not going to work. And so I say to you who don't know Christ or to you who are on the fence, your way won't work. It's nothing personal. My way won't work. None of our ways will work. We need God. And it shouldn't surprise us. He made us that way. Imagine a creator who said, I'm going to make you, and then I don't care what you do. I don't care how you go. Do your thing. Versus a creator who created us in order to honor him, in order to glorify, in order to worship, in order to serve, in order to love, and then in order to receive from him life and peace. That's how humans work. And so if you don't like it, my word to you today is however you may huff, however you may puff, you can never fill you up. Never. If that's news to you, well, let me be the first person to welcome you to the truth. You're not enough on your own. But here's the good news. God doesn't leave us on on our own. He comes to us. He came to the prophet Ezekiel, and we read in Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 2, when God calls Ezekiel, he comes to Ezekiel. And Ezekiel writes the record, he says, and he spoke. And as he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. Ezekiel, this prophet, gets filled up with the Spirit of the living God. He hears the Spirit of the living God speaking to him, sending him to God's people, sending Ezekiel to God's people. And Ezekiel goes to God's people, and he says this to them. Rid yourselves of all the offenses you have committed. This is Ezekiel 18, 31. He's prophesying according to the Spirit of God. God told him, he's telling the people, rid yourselves of the offenses you have committed and get a new heart and a new spirit. 
Why will you die, people of Israel? It's a rhetorical question. Why would you want to die? Why would you want to go your own way? God will help you. He'll save you. And then later on, God says, echoing Ezekiel, I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. And so then our job is to say, what? Okay. That sounds pretty good. What do I got to do? Rid yourself of your offenses, sins, that so easily entangle. I'm not the only one here that struggles with sin. I'm not the only one here that stumbles and falls and, and goes, oh, I'm no good. Even as a believer, I still struggle. This is part of what it means to be human. There is coming a day when in our new bodies, our new spirit, Christ is present. We won't struggle. We won't stumble anymore. But for the duration of this part of your journey, you and I are going to continue to struggle. But here's the thing. Paul says in Romans 5, chapter 5, God's love has been poured out like water into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. This is the fulfillment of Ezekiel's prophecy. The Holy Spirit has been given to us. He was given to Ezekiel for a particular calling, but he's been given to all believers. The Spirit is now available to all human beings, regardless of who you are, regardless of what you've done, regardless of where you've been or who you've been with. The good news says God's hand is open, his heart is poured out, will you receive him? Will you receive the spirit of the living God? And for those who have said yes, who have said, oh, that's the offer? Well, all right, I'm sick and tired of huffing and puffing. I want you to fill me up. Fill me up. Paul says this in Galatians 4, 6, because you are his sons, his children, because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. And from this I conclude a couple things. Number one, the spirit lives within all who come to Christ by faith, and this spirit is not silent. The spirit speaks. He speaks. And the word he says is, repeat after me, Father. You go ahead, you try it. Go, Father, try it. This is what the Spirit says to us. He said, well, he's not my daddy. No, my daddy, uh, he, he's a good guy, pretty good, you know, he's, he's all right. You know, that was my dad. Or my, oh man, my dad, yeah, he was, he was a piece of work. Let me tell you about my dad. No, that's my dad. No, if you're talking about who the father of Jesus is, well, that's God. But me, I'm just a lonely old little human being here. This is the way I say it. I got a dad. He's right there, Bob Badger, sitting next to my mom. And they're here today and worthy of applause. And so that's my dad. And he would tell you he did the best he knew. And he did a great job. But his job was just to prepare me to know my heavenly father. In the same way that his dad's job was to prepare him to know his heavenly father. And some dads do a great job. Some dads do a mediocre job. Some dads do a mm, this kind of job. But every dad, every parent's job is what scripture says. Teach my word to your kids so that when they grow up, they will call on me as their heavenly father. And I got four kids, and they're sitting over here. My job is to not be their eternal father. My job is to prepare them to know. Earlier, when we were praying for our kids as they prepare to go back to school, if it were up to us to protect our kids 24-7, if it were up to us to make sure that our kids become uh, the best human beings that they can become, if it were up to us to somehow work in our kids' hearts, to transform them, to be like God, whoo boy, we, we'd be in a world of trouble if it were up to us. When we pray and ask God to do a work in our kids, we're acknowledging we're not enough. Only God is enough 
to grow a young person into a grown person. When I say grown, I don't mean tall. I mean like Christ. Our job is to do the heavy lifting when they're real young so that they, by God's Spirit, can do the heavy lifting now that they're grown. And when you look at the children who turn out all right, and you say, must have been their parents, that's part of it. But I promise you, the parent of a grown child who's honoring the Lord says, look what God has done. I promise you. And they're going to say, hey, we did our best. We did what we knew to do. And we screwed up sometimes. But God is working in their hearts. Why would we pray and ask God to work in their hearts if we didn't think it's God they need? Here's the good news. Spirit speaks. And Paul prays this for the Colossian believers. We, this is Paul and all those with him, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will. You praying this for your kids? You praying this for the people you're responsible for? I pray, oh God, that you would fill them with the knowledge of your will and wisdom and understanding that only the Spirit gives. Now, I've I've been a parent for 18 years now, and I have experienced that maybe, maybe 5% of the words that come out of my mouth land. I'm being realistic here. You know, so I I talk a lot more than the words actually land. I say a lot of things, and some of those things go, but then I look back and I go, I think it was pretty much the same with my parents. (laughs) About 5% of what they said actually got in. But the Spirit of the living God is already inside those who belong to God. So when we're saying, gosh, I wish you would listen to me more, pause for a second. I wish you'd listen to him more. I'm praying that the Spirit who lives within you would fill you up with wisdom and with understanding, and with the knowledge of His will. Because, let's face it, His track record is much better than mine. I don't always listen to Him. So I say to you today, Paul didn't just pray for kids, he prayed for believers. With the writer of Hebrews, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, I've already told you he's speaking. Can you hear what he says? Well, I'm pretty sure I know what the Spirit's saying to me. The Spirit's saying to me, you know, I'm doing good, I'm doing fine, I'm, I'm just good. Thank you, Pastor. I'm sure that some other people in this room need to hear from God. Me and Jesus, we're good. All right. But I have an inkling. I have, a, I have a, a guess that you're like me, and not only do you not always hear what the Spirit says, you probably are like me in that you're not always listening to what the Spirit says. This is why Jesus says seven times, like ringing a bell, bong, whoever has ears, Let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Bong, seven verses later. Let everyone who has ears hear. The thing about the Spirit is He's hard to hear. It's hard to hear. And why is this? It's not because you've got an old nature. It's not because of Lumpus. It's because of Lumpus' ghost. And this is what I call remaining sin or the brokenness that we harbor with us or the way that I've defined Lumpus' ghost is everything inside of you that hasn't yet received Christ's love and yielded to Christ's rule. The Spirit truly does live inside of you. You are not in one moment of the flesh nature and then in the next moment of the Spirit nature. That's not how it works. You don't have two natures. You have one nature. You're either old or new. 
dead or alive. But even living people get it wrong sometimes. They hear that old voice. And so they must choose. You must choose. If you are new, you must choose to listen this way or to listen that way. And it's not always easy. I uh, was in New York this past weekend for a wedding. A young couple that uh, I got to know him when he was 14. He's now 28. Can you believe it? He was 14 when I got to know him. And he served in the worship ministry. And he's grown now. And he said, would you and Allison come up and do our wedding? And I, and I said, sure. And he said, and I want to pay your airfare. And I want to pay for your hotel. I'm like, well, then double sure. <laughs> yeah, we're coming. And so we were there for the wedding. And uh, so great couple, uh, Will and Rebecca, and had such a Christ-honoring ceremony. But at the reception, there were two guys that I've known for forever. And these two guys were in a men's cell group with me for nine months. I want to say nine months. Men's cell group. There were four of us. And uh, so it was me, John, Bob, Ed. And John and Bob were at the wedding reception. And independently... Both of them came up to me, you know, hugs and, oh, it's so good to see you. It's the first time we've been back in three years and seeing, you know, friends and, and spiritual family. And they both come up and give me a hug, and they both say, you know what? I remember so vividly this conversation we had when we were in a cell group together. Independently. They had no idea that they, they each said this conversation with me. And both of them, independently of each other, said, and remember the prayer you asked us to pray? And, I, of course, I knew exactly what they were going to say because we talked about it for a long time. You asked us to pray, Father, show me one thing inside that you want to change. Father, show me one place in my heart, and I would say it this way today, where Lumpus's ghost is kicking my butt, where that old voice has still got me going the wrong way. But, but what I said to them was, I want, let's, let's pray this week, men. Let's just pray this week. Father, show me one thing. And they nodded. And they said, yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. And then we met once a week, and we came back the next Wednesday morning. And I said, so, fellas, uh, what did God show you? And they went, huh? What are you talking about? Well, remember the prayer you were going to pray? Yeah, it was a great prayer. Oh, you wanted us to actually pray it, they said. And uh, for Bob, Bob came up to me, and he said, he said, the, he said the thing was I didn't, I didn't think you were serious. Like you said, you know, Father, show me one thing. And I thought, yeah, that's a great prayer. But I didn't realize you meant me. And actually, I should. And I'm like, well, I prayed. And let me tell you about what God showed me over the week. John, uh, his thing was, he came back and he said, I didn't pray it. I want to tell you why. I got scared. I got scared. And I said, well, I already knew the answer. But I said, what was the fear? And he said, I was afraid that God wouldn't show me one thing. He'd show me everything. And I said, I can relate to that. I can relate to that. But I want to ask you something. So the Spirit lives in you, yes? He goes, yes. I said, you got some good theology there. The Spirit lives within you. He hasn't showed you everything yet, has he? And John said, this is at our breakfast meeting. He said, no, he hasn't. So you think then that because you said, show me one thing, God in all His mercy and in all His grace is going to go, I've been waiting for you to finally ask me this prayer. Now I'm going to dump it all on you like a ton of bricks. He goes, no, that doesn't sound like God, does it? I said, no, that doesn't sound like God. If he hasn't showed you anything in a while, he's probably not concerned with crushing you. He's probably not up there going, just give me a shot, I'll pound you flat. <laughs> but he probably is pleased when we say, your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. You probably have desires for me if I would just have ears to hear. If I would just open the door. If I would just say, Jesus, show me. So the next week, they did it. Bob, John, and Ed prayed the prayer and came back the following week. And John's first words were, oh, that was great. That was great. He said, I prayed the prayer. I said, God, show me one thing. And he kind of, show me one thing. And he said, and God did. 
And he said, but when he showed me this thing in my life that he wanted to change, he didn't do it in a crushing, condemning way. He did it the way that a father would take a son aside and say, son, I want to share something with you. And he showed me this thing in my life. But then he was right there to say, I haven't crushed you with this because I love you. You're my son. And when you pray and follow the leading of my spirit, as Paul says in Romans 8, it pleases me. Bob said to me at the wedding uh, reception, he said, for me, it was, uh, God saved me out of gambling. He said, I was uh, uh, addicted to gambling. And when God saved me, I got clean. And I never struggled with gambling again. But then I started buying lottery tickets. And for him, buying lottery tickets was a sin. But he kind of did it on the sly. And it was the kind of thing where he would go into the convenience store, again, give me three, but just don't tell my wife. So for him, it was a sin, but he'd done this little math in his head where even though for him it was a sin, and God had saved him from that sin, it had become a hang-up for him again. Now, regardless of what you think of lottery tickets, for me, uh, it's not a struggle. For me, I, I've, never, I've never had any desire to own a lottery ticket. I've scratched some off that people gave me as gifts. But the point here is not about lottery tickets. The point is he listened to the Spirit. And for you the struggle might be something else. Your temper, your lust, your materialism, your attitude toward others, your isolation from the body of Christ. Maybe any number of things, a resentment toward a person that you just say, well, I'll budge when they budge. Like Jesus said. Wait, that's not what Jesus said. But whatever that thing may be, our Father who is rich in mercy puts His arm around us and says, I'm so glad you asked. Now my Spirit who speaks will speak. The struggle that many of us have is we put the Spirit in a box. We put the Holy Spirit in a box and we say, you can talk when you say things I agree with. Or you can talk when you speak the words of Scripture, but don't put it on me. It's for other people. What Paul is saying is, you are the box. Your body, your mind, your soul is where the Spirit lives. You got him in a box on the shelf, but he lives inside of you by God's design. The time for fear is past. Christ in you has come at last. This past week, I struggled with some messages, some messages that were triggered by what I consider to be a failure, failure to achieve a goal. I had a goal. I failed to achieve it. It was a personal slash professional goal, and I failed to achieve it. Not for lack of trying. Tried, prayed, sought help. And I'm struggling now with this message. I failed, I failed, I failed. And I'm probably not the only person in here who struggles with messages like that. And I felt miserable. And I said, well, instead of just giving in to Lumpus's ghost, who's the one that's telling me you failed, you're no good, you're this, you're that, I'm going to take it, I'm going to take it to the Lord. So first I pray, then I journal to get my thoughts nice and clear. And then I talk to my good Christian friend. And then I talked to a a friend who's also a professional coach. And I talked to my wife. And all of them give me good feedback. So I, I, I make my way through all of the cloud and the fog of Lumpus's ghost and how he's talking to me and condemning me and telling me all these horrible things about me. And I finally get clean of all of that. And I say, okay, God, now what are you saying? And you know what he said to me? He said, you built a team you acted in love, and you were generous. And I said, but I still failed. And he said, did you? And I said, I suppose I failed if all I cared about was success. 
But I care about much more than that. I care about how I do the thing. And what you're telling me, Spirit, is that, in fact, I may not have succeeded at the task, but I can see that my heart was with you. And I have these friends in my life who are full of your Spirit instead of full of it. And they're telling me what happened in my life. They're showing me things that I couldn't see without them. And now I feel full, and I feel joy, and all because I listened not to the flesh, not to Lumpus' ghost, but I listened to your spirit. I got close to you, Jesus, and he's within you, my friends. He is within you, but you've got to learn how to hear him, and you've got to have people in your life who will be faithful feedback givers, and you've got to be open and humble and small before the Lord. Because when you come with your fear and your brokenness and your pride and you throw elbows and you go, you just tell me what I want to hear, Jesus, otherwise I don't want to hear from you at all. You won't hear from him. And you'll be wise in your own eyes. And you'll be big in your own eyes. And you won't be following his spirit. We're coming now to the picture of God's love for us. When God showed His love for us, He did so through an act of love, sending His Son, Jesus, to the cross. But just before Jesus went to the cross, He sat down with His disciples and said, I want to be clear about one thing. I'm doing this out of love, and every time you remember how I love you, I want you to ingest eat, drink the sign of my love. And what I conclude from Jesus' act in that upper room with that bread and that cup is that once again, he's reminding us we got to let him in. We got to let his love in. That's where he wants to be. Not separate but two into one as we eat the bread, as we drink the cup in just a moment. You have time to listen. The Spirit is speaking to you. Shh. Let Him.
he broke it. My Jesus was broken so that I might be made whole. His body divided. And if I let him in, he'll take my divided heart and make me whole. Jesus said, this is my body. As often as you eat this bread, do this in remembrance of me. taking the cup. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out. You remember Paul, Romans 5, 5? His spirit has been poured out into our hearts. What Jesus poured out, we take in. His love poured out. His Spirit poured out. As you receive this love, you receive not only forgiveness, you receive union, oneness with the living God. No separation. As often as you drink this cup, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the gift of your spirit. This gift that keeps on giving, as it were. And today, you have been poured out into our hearts all over again as we've listened, as we've allowed you freedom to speak, to lead us, to prompt us, to love us. May we be a people who are committed to living, walking in you this week. Show me one thing or two. Show me what you want me to see. We thank you, Jesus, for your love, for the grace by which you lead us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.